Good evening, everybody from York in England, and I uh, hope you can um, welcome to our Open Clock Club live stream. Uh, we haven't got the full team here at the moment, it's just me. Uh, so the live chat, please, if you uh, <laughs> need to manage it yourselves, if there's anybody there, I can't see. Um, anyway, so for those of you that are new to this uh, part of our product, our Open Clock Club thing. Um, this is just a weekly hour or thereabouts, maybe a bit more, of just kind of like wandering through the live stream uh, re clock repair process. The clock we've got is an early 19th century English or European weight-driven long case clock. And in the first week, we did some kind of approach to the object and then we've been doing a bit of cleaning of the sort of um, ancillary parts, the pendulum, uh, as you can see here, the weights, the pendulum bob and so on, as we move towards um, looking at our clock. And um, in fact, today, once we've dealt with these uh, weights and things, we're going to start looking at the list of uh, jobs that our clock needs. And if you saw what we did last week, then you will have uh, heard us talking about threads. So we talked about um, historic threads, matching, how you can work around that. We did a bit of thread measuring and so on. So we're gonna progress that part of the project as well, which is making a little kind of adapter for the bottom of the pendulum rod where the pendulum rod had been broken off and we lost about a quarter of an inch of thread. Um, I'll just have a look at the... Um, historic threads, map. Great. Well, I can see uh, at least Chris and Sam and Neil are there. That's about all I can do. <laughs> so, there are at least three of you. Anyway, so welcome to um, this week. So, I've saved you the uh, dire boredom of washing these uh, components, these ancillary parts, off air. Um, as you will remember, all we're doing here in terms of washing is uh, a wash with um, our natural bristle brushes. Here we've got our usual sort of paintbrush type thing with the ferrule protected uh, by archival cotton tape to prevent it scratching. And we've got another one here, which is a favourite, uh, again, a little natural bristle brush. So we wash in mineral spirits, or I do anyway, and then I uh, rinse, and then we've had them in the drying oven. So if I just put on some gloves, what I'm going to do, and um, sorry to repeat uh, myself week after week, but the reason um, I deal with the weights and the pendulum and the, all that stuff first is because what you don't want is the movement kind of hanging around under the sort of pretext of being finished when the job is in fact uh, far from finished. And so the movement either gets dusty or you end up in a rush because you're delivering to your client and that kind of thing. But you know, that's just my way of approaching it, having gone through uh, nightmarish, <laughs> many, many nightmarish projects where I've kind of ignored all this stuff and then thought at the end, uh, oh, blimey, there's actually a lot to do. In fact, with the pendulum, the weights, the dial, the hands, all that stuff can be, you know, more than 50% of the whole amount of work. In fact, once you get into cleaning the movement, you're in a way, you're kind of on the, on the home stretch. However, with this clock, as we'll see a bit later on, um, we've got quite a few repairs to do on the movement. So hopefully, that will be the kind of exciting uh, side of it. So um, yeah, here's our uh, cast iron pendulum bob and you can see it's washed nicely, got all the dust and spiders webs off it. Still got quite a lot of um, the drying media stood in, stuck in there. So I won't, I'll try and get that out, but I won't wrap that up yet. Uh, the weights, they're warm, kind of hand warm, so we can deal with those and 
wrap them up, put labels on and put them to one side with our seat board and uh, balls plate that we did last week. So let's do that first. Uh, let's deal with these weights um, and I'll have a little prod at the pendulum bob to um, get those gritty cups out. One thing that's um, useful actually is, is if you've got um, a, the space in your workshop is to get a compressor, a little uh, water, a compressor with a kind of water trap in it. So it's come, uh, the air that comes out of it is dry, but it's really good for this kind of thing. It speeds up um, this whole process. Um, I've got my, I'll put some cotton tape through there actually to pull it through to clear out the rest of that um, drying media um, medium. So yeah, a compressor is really great. Uh, I forget the name of them, but there are some kind of, I think the white and green, they're only about this big, um, but then they're called silent. They're not silent, but they're actually really quiet, uh, really useful um, uh, to have in and around the workshop. You'll notice that um, these weights have got some paint splats on them. They've obviously been out of the case when the room's been decorated, building's been decorated. And um, I don't know what you think of those. Uh, again, in the live chat that I can't really see. Oh, Jeremy's there too from uh, Hazelmere. Um, fire bingo. Oh, fire. Yeah, we, we might. I don't think we'll get around to fire tonight, but um, I'm going to make a, uh, a die out of gauge plate. It probably won't be this week, uh, if that's what you mean, uh, Sam. And um, that'll be good because I've got quite a good chunk of um, ground flat stock to heat up and harden and then temper again. So, yeah. And especially if the hairdressers don't ring up, there's um, in the next couple of weeks, there's every chance of something setting on fire. So paint splats, what do you think out there? Leave them, uh, cover them up, um, sit for hours with a scalpel and pick them off. I'm obviously perfectly cool with them. They, this uh, clock has a solid wood trunk door, so it's not like a kind of regulator where the paint, where the weight would be seen. And I probably wouldn't bother about it anyway. They are stable in the sense that they're not gonna cause any damage. Um, I suppose what you could do if you wanted to kind of go for a sort of halfway house is to get some uh, artist's oil black, just lamp black type oil paint and thin it down with turpentine spirit or something and kind of give the whole weights a bit of a, a once over, which won't get rid of the paint, of course, but it will sort of tone it down a bit. The problem for me with that is that if the minute you refinish or repaint anything, everything else kind of stands out like a sore thumb, as we say here in, uh, in North Yorkshire. So um, I'm kind of going to live with them. Yeah, maybe if you had a microscope and a scalpel and a couple of days, you could pick at those and, and get rid of them, uh, which, you know, they, they may just lift off. Uh, yeah, I don't know, really. They don't bother me. Um, or, of course, what you could do is you could cover the whole thing and sort of... Um, paint them. I don't know whether these are um, were had any kind of colouring on. I guess they were black from you, but I don't know. So again, um, if uh, vote leave from a bunch of paint splats from the kiss. Yeah, my uh, Gent's clock as well has got paint splats on it, because of course those clocks are really, um, you know, hernia inducing if you want to move them. So people don't move them to paint around them. And the good thing about that with dial clocks is that if you paint round it enough times, it gets stuck to the wall. So when you open the bezel, it doesn't move to one side and go out of beat. Um, so whether or not the uh, weights were black when they were new, I've been um, looking at lathes, <laughs> looking at lathes this week, 
and uh, need a bigger lathe, of course, as we all do, or several, in fact. And uh, saw that some of the Swiss makers, I think it was Micron, um, just because the castings were so good from new, the iron castings, they just left them as cast, that kind of grey colour, which of course is very beautiful. So they weren't painted, which is really cool. Um, but it's the usual thing here. Whatever finish is on there is, in my view, of, um, of value because there's a story there. And it's not to say that that story doesn't continue, of course. You can be part of that story by uh, intervention. I uh, am broadly sort of a conservator, so I can't do that. And frankly, I don't want to do it because there are so many clocks and bits. I'm not stuck for uh, a job. Um, but anyway, so you could also put on that, um, what do they call it, the, uh, the black graphite that you put on... Um, uh, like a stoves, ranges, Yorkshire ranges. Um, yeah, that might look quite nice. Um, uh, the uh, Zebo, Zebrite or something to call it, can't remember. Anyway, one of you uh, will know for sure. Um, what about slate black? Oh yeah, uh, well, Jeremy says, what about slate black? Is that what you mean, Jeremy? That stuff that you put on fire hearths, which I think is graphite, isn't it? It's not kind of black, black, but it's, um, sort of grey, well, as it's, uh, it's it's graphite. Have you got an extinguisher, Matthew? Yes, I've got a fire extinguisher and a fire blanket. And um, yeah, it, and not quite, but will have very, very, very soon, obviously a chemical as, I've, yeah, I've only just started here, but building up already a little inventory of uh, flammables. So it's absolutely essential to get a flammables cabinet um, and a fire extinguisher and a fire blanket, um, uh, of course, yeah. Uh, what else have I got then? You do occasionally see other colours. It's much, I've never read the live chat before, it's much more interesting than actually fixing the clock. Um, it's, uh, you do see other colours, you see a lot of that kind of caramelly sort of brown, which I think was a mid 20th century coverall um, sort of sort of paint. But interesting about the paint colours, of course, uh, what you don't tend to get is black um, without going totally off piste onto something that I know absolutely nothing around about. Um, here in York, like most towns up and down uh, Britain, um, there are iron railings uh, or what, what's left of iron railings after the war. And the iron railings here are original to the property, which is about 100 years old. And we did a bit of a paint sample sort of analysis on it. And I can't quite remember when the date was, but before a certain date, they were never black, black, like we know it today. They were either blue, black or green, black, um, those kinds of colours. But it'd be cool to, um, to have a look at these, but they do, maybe it's just the white that stands out. Anyway, enough of that. So I'm just going to put on some of our uh, trusty microcrystalline wax. Um, when the wax gets all a bit skanky like that, what you can do is you can put the tin with the lid on um, in uh, a bain marie. So um, just basically uh, put it in boiling water or very hot water and the wax melts. It's paraffin wax and all the junk seems to sink to the bottom and that way in a nice Yorkshire way you can um, keep it going for a long time and they sell this wax this breed in the, these cans which are quite a lot of money but if you use a lot of this again when we used to have a sort of more commercial workshop um, you can buy a bigger tin of it which I think they call a decorators pack and in fact if there are a few people who live within I don't know, a clock club or BHI or something like that. It's worth buying um, a so-called decorators pack and splitting it up. It's much cheaper uh, that way. So remember, these weights are warm. So as soon as I'm brushing this uh, wax on, the solvent here, I think, is white spirits again. So that, that does, in fact, sort of, you know, darken the colour a little bit um, as it is. And then I'm going to wait for it to dry or to for the solvent to evaporate and then brush it and then wrap them up. And then I can show you what little bit of progress I've made on, um, on the pendulum thing. 
uh, I think last week we uh, talked about thinking about a pitch, thread pitch, that was um, about 0.7 millimetres, uh, about 0.7 millimetre. And I think as far as I'm... Um, invisible green for railings. Well, I don't actually use um, a drying oven. The one that I've used and had most success with, but they are expensive and you find them on, uh, you do find them on eBay. There's two kinds. One is uh, the thing they put laboratory glass in, which has kind of got a sliding doors, looks a bit like a chip shop uh, sort of uh, range thing. They're all right, but the best one is the, uh, something like the Gallon Camp, um, I think they call it hot box one, because the beauty of that is it's totally safe, so you can just put it on. And when I've worked in institutions, we just have one of those and just basically leave it on the whole time. Um, and I keep in uh, everything dry, which was uh, good. Yeah, I think the, uh, the yeah, you could put um, boot polish on these, of course, if you want to just blacken them a little bit, darken them a little bit. As I say, I'm the, my, my problem with anything that's going to change the colour, this is obviously changing the colour a little bit, is that once you're on a slippery slope of kind of making things all sort of um, match. But I suppose there's a line of thinking that says that your customer can see, uh, I don't actually buy into that, by the way, I'm just not quite know I'm saying it. Um, but there's a line of thinking that says the customer needs to see evidence of um, your work. Uh, I've never had that problem um, yet, anyway. Uh, the, I took a clock back week before last, and it kind of just looked as it did before I got it, you know, um, externally. Um, but apart from the fact it was working. So yeah, there's um, a lot of white on here and some of that caramelly color, which I suppose got and turned later in the 20th century into magnolia. But I don't think, I think magnolia is probably a 70s, 80s invention, is it? Uh, that name. And I think that came out of whatever was that kind of a state brown. You go around a lot of country houses, especially in the down um, below stairs bit, it's often painted that sort of caramelly brown. And I presume that was because, it, as they say in Yorkshire, didn't show muck uh, where your fingerprints uh, had been. Otherwise, they would have presumably um, painted it white. Yeah. The fascinating world of paint splats. Anyway, I'll just leave those for the... Um, wax to evaporate. Yeah, those things like, um, what's the name of this thing here? Naderman extraction and gallon camp, um, drying ovens and all that sort of laboratory stuff. You do often see those, they don't come up on eBay very often, but there are often industrial sales. And I think the reason why they come up is because as far as um, research laboratories and so on go, particularly if you live in somewhere like Cambridge or uh, where there are lots of research laboratories, um, that equipment gets written off, presumably financially, but also it seemed to be kind of out of date. So it's just renewed. So you do seem to get a lot of that um, on the market. I once got a really nice uh, bench drill by Jones and Shipman, which I regret selling from a research laboratory in uh, Cambridge and it was absolutely mint it had been really beautifully looked after but for whatever reason I decided to sell it and um, well I don't know. regret maybe isn't quite the right, right word but, uh, but there you go I've got quite a lot of stuff in there. I say the uh, this is where a compressor. Maybe I'll tie it on the end. Oh no, there we are. We're done. Uh, a compressor would be a good idea. So this um, in our book, 
did I mention our book yet? Only uh, three times so far tonight. In our book, we show this technique. It's really useful for cleaning uh, things like barrel arbor holes and that hole in the front plate of a long case clock that's sort of rectangular where the warning flag goes. Um, I once had a really painful, um, because all these great experiences are basically <laughs> built on pain, a really painful experience with one of those uh, with a 30 hour clock. And um, I had overhauled it and everything. And I did it on test and took it back. And then the customer rang up and said that it was failing sometimes to uh, stop striking. And um, I couldn't find anything wrong with it. It drove me absolutely bonkers. But eventually I found that that rectangular aperture in the front plate how it wasn't completely sort of cleaned out. And there was a bit of sticky yuck in there, oil or something. And like once in every 40 or 50 strike cycles, um, it would just hang up and prevent the striking from locking and it would get out of sync. But uh, anyway, it got there eventually, but it was um, a rather uh, sort of painful experience. So there we are, there's our nice cast iron pendulum bob looking all clean and that will be wrapped up now and ready for um, ready for receiving the uh, rating uh, slide when we get that sorted out, which hopefully won't be long. Right, what's happening down here? What's wrong in the wife's hair dryer? What chemicals called asbestos fingers from that period? Yes, uh, kit tools from the kitchen that get used up in the um, get used in the clocks workshop or the hairdryer. There we go. Yeah, the good thing about having an oven um, or putting the things in the oven is that these kind of bigger objects, you can put them in there really low and just leave them and all the solvent evaporates off. But um, you've got to be obviously quite careful with that. Right, let's get these wrapped up and we can get onto something more interesting. What could be more interesting is than talking about paints flats. Don't forget the label. It says to themselves. There's the label. There we go. And Twenty. <laughs> Great. Gosh, not long to go till Christmas. Mmm, yogurt dryer. We need a um, report on the Facebook group about the success of the yogurt dryer for drying clock parts. Okay, that's one thing done. We'll just stick that with the rest. Which you seem to have lost. And then, yeah.
So good again to see you all on Facebook, to see what you're up to with your various projects and helpful advice for beginners. Left. Got some new labels, yet more um, unfettered excitement this week. Got a box of labels. Uh, I use those uh, Merit merit brand tags. I quite like those. Uh, in the museum world, uh, there's a lot of use of Tyvek labels with Tyvek type string, uh, which are great if you want um, long-term storage, of course, because they sort of don't decompose, but that's also um, uh, can be a bad thing as well. So uh, I just use the regular sort of paper ones. I don't think they're acid free. I think you can buy acid free uh, book ones from preservation equipment and what's the name of your uh, conservation supplies, do they call it? No, anyway, uh, you can buy acid free uh, labels for these where they're on for a week or a couple of weeks. I just use regular stationary ones. Oh, Wolf has been working on a watch. Yay. What kind of watch is it, Wolfie? Are we allowed to ask? Well, we have asked, so there you go. Um, interesting question about um, watches and carriage clocks. Basically, uh, you may have noticed that we call this thing how to repair pendulum clocks. And that is obviously incredibly um, sort of pointed that uh, I don't any longer work on carriage clocks or wrist watches and things. But many people do and people enjoy them. And um, it's, I, I don't work on them because for me, it's um, a, a different discipline, different equipment or more equipment, different um, focus, doesn't like that. more kind of um, lots more cleanliness around the workshop. It's often surprised me that particularly people who do cases and clocks and watches, how they manage to stop the watches being full of dust, but presumably uh, they do. Um, if you've not worked on watches before, I'm a Navy graph for the new in-house movement, managed to get it from seven seconds to about three seconds a day. All right, great, three seconds a day, good. Is that without a timing machine? It's just regulating it and uh, keeping an eye on it. So yeah, watches are interesting. If you are new to uh, repairing clocks, which is what this channel is meant to be about, um, then be incredibly cautious because people obviously will pick up on the fact that you repair clocks and neighbours, friends, family and all that kind of thing. Um, why we say in our book again, I've mentioned it twice now, I'll try and get up to 10 times. Uh, in our book, <laughs> they, uh, we took, we, advise you strongly only to work on clocks you own um, or have been given to you or something uh, because um, otherwise uh, disaster and particularly with if you decide to start working on carriage clocks or uh, watches then again run through a fair few um, that you own I would say before you actually start to take them in in any kind of uh, sort of commercial sense. Writing's already getting scruffier by the second. 
Good. Well, that's the uh, super dull bit out of the way, nearly. Let's just get this wrapped up. Um, and then we will have a quick look at how far I've got, which is not very far, because I don't do any work on this during the week, on thinking about this thread. But I've got a couple of uh, exciting um, material things to talk about. Uh, yeah, we had a nice... Uh, query today on Facebook about um, one of, I've got a clock in, many clocks in bits somewhere, one of those wire springs for a 20th century mantle clock. And because they, are, unlike the French clock springs, they're not tapered, they often always break off at the bottom. Um, so if you replace them, we advise today, I think a couple of people said the same thing. Um, uh, Rachel, you haven't as much. You're still wrapping presents, right? Okay. Uh, I am. Can you imagine when it's Rachel's birthday in a few <laughs> months' time, getting some nice cast iron clock weights? What more could you want? I was like, we're making a just still on the stair. Harriet, do a tea, please. Are you okay with it? Yeah, yeah, really good. Right, good. You've endured that. Thank you for uh, sticking with it. Um, time grapher on the iPhone. Oh, that's interesting. Um, do bull clocks count as pendulum clocks? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you mean the electromagnetic ones? Yeah, I think uh, we've got to really open our arms wide to embrace electromagnetic clocks. When I started in clock making many decades ago, um, people were very sniffy about uh, electromagnetic clocks, but in Maine, in, in Maine, yeah, not in part, due to the uh, AHS Electrical Horology Group and the work at Clockworks, sort of electrical horology has really sort of um, ris risen up in its uh, sort of a level of acceptance and the work of Bob Miles and people like that and the Synchronome book. So I say yes to bull clocks. I've never worked on one. I've got two uh, hip toggle clocks, homemade hip toggle clocks in this room and the gents are gents. Uh, so yeah, I think so. If it's got a pendulum, one of the big problems with watches and carriage clocks, is that, going back to that, is dueling. Um, because a dual bearing and a, a, and a brass bearing just kind of work in surprisingly different ways. So you can take a carriage clock apart, put it back together, clean it, no problem, until you get a broken dual. And particularly if it's a rubbed in jewel, I see on other fora, uh, not mentioning names, um, that people push out rubbed in jewels and replace them with friction jewels, which for me is like really um, not great, uh, frankly. So um, we are speaking of that. We're trying to get um, Icon Dynamic Objects group together and hopefully we're going to get somebody on there a bit like this, but to talk about uh, making jewels as well, but that's a long way off. Um, so yeah, jeweling is really difficult because a lot of the historic sizes are no longer made. Um, but you can, of course, again, if you get a copy of Daniels, you can make them yourself. So this is where I've got with my um, little bit of time spent on this today. Let's just get things a bit more organized here, as you can see. This is where I've got with the uh, chap for the bottom of the pendulum. But I'll move the lathe out of the way for a second. We don't actually need that at the moment. So if you remember what was going on was, um, this is our slide that goes inside the cast iron pendulum, Bob was just saying, needs a bit of cleaning up, but we'll do that a bit later on. And the pendulum rod that comes in here, which we straightened up last week, had broken off. So we got the little broken off bit out, but it wasn't really rescuable. So I don't want to shorten the pendulum, obviously, because then the rating nut will have to go down. <laughs> uh, and not that that's, it was, if it was around here, that's fine. But you don't want the rating nut to be right down the bottom of the thread. So we've lost about a quarter of an inch of length in the thing, the, uh, the rod. So what I'm going to try and do is to match the thread that's in here, which is a non-standardized, or at least it's not Whitworth, BA metric, blah, 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 
Um, and I'm going to do that by, I've, I've made this little spigot, let's call it that for the time being, and I put a taper on it because the bottom of the pendulum rod thread is tapered. When you look at these um, as pendulum rod threads, it's a dead giveaway when people make new ones with BA uh, threads. There's no, nothing wrong with that, but there are parallel threads and you usually see a bit of thread sticking out. So ideally what I'd like is I'd like to thread right up to the shoulder here with a 0.7 millimeter pitch thread that's about 3.2 millimeters major diameter. Now we're in luck, he says, because um, M4, so this is bog standard metric four, is uh, about, oh, it is 0.7 millimeters, and it's fractionally too coarse but you can only kind of see it running out after about 30 threads or something. So I'm not bothered about that because this thing jams in the hole essentially and it stays there. So this is going to give us our 0.7 millimeter pitch, um, but it's, uh, it does what it says in the can and it's four millimeters uh, major diameter or thereabouts. But, and um, engineers, uh, you may have to put your fingers in your ears at this point, which is nothing new. Um, I finished how this and decode is seven from Um, sorry, the slide chat is surprisingly interesting, so I'm just distracted by it. Jordan's saying Ben Hills is on his reading list, yay! Very right, okay, um, good. Well, so now you understand uh, the relationship between barometric compensation and temperature compensation and uh, whatever else it is, barometric temperature and uh, our circular error, of course. Uh, cool, good. Are you going to make a clock? That would be really, uh, really nice. Um, anyway, M4 is obviously four millimetres major diameter. So that's about 0.8 of a millimetre too big. However, uh, if you're new to making threads and things, uh, sorry if you're, this is all news to you, this thing is, you can see it's got a split in it, it's called the split die, and that means that you can squeeze it together or open it up a little bit to change the value or the, uh, the thread diameter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to squeeze it together as much as I reasonably can, uh, hoping that it doesn't break. And uh, to do that, we need a die holder. So, uh, where's Right, I don't like to say that things were better in the old days and <laughs> whinge on about it. Uh, but if you buy a die holder today, the chances are that you'll get something like this and it, they are really like totally rubbish. Uh, I don't know why they make them out of this cast material. You can see this one's bent. The threads always strip and because they're made out of really soft, chewy material, the die never sits down in the die holder properly. Uh, I don't get it because it can't be that much more expensive. And this isn't a cheap set. This is uh, branded Linden, uh, which I think they're probably made in Germany, but wh whatever. Um, it's not a cheap, a cheap set, but the die holder is really terrible. So uh, that's 15, 16 diameter. Um, I've nicked this one from my BA set, which is made by Lehman Archer Lane, L-A-L. Uh, and you can see it's got this beautiful, you can see like the sort of oil colored finish on it, sort of rainbow mottled finish. And it's actually made out of hardened steel. Um, so even though this is probably, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years old, and this is like nearly new, this has had it, and this will probably go on kind of forever. Um, and the other thing is that the die is an incredibly, if I haven't got any swarf in the bottom of it, which I have a bit, just give it a bit of a clean out. The, the die is an incredibly good fit in here. 
which means that it fits square. Um, now, if again, we've got a big lathe available or bigger lathe, we can uh, put the die in a tailstock, die tailstock holder, which will keep it all square and everything, but uh, I don't at the moment. So there you go. So how it works for people who haven't done this before, but maybe you all have some, um, wouldn't it be nice if Matthew was organized? Uh, no, uh, yeah, it would, uh, that ain't gonna happen. Um, I don't know in what, in which specific um, uh, area, but yes, it would in any area of life. However, I've got to this ripe old age. I don't know if it's going to happen now. Um, so the die is split and it's kind of a bit springy. It's hardened and tempered steel. So by uh, winding this screw in here, which has got a point on it, you can open the die up to its maximum diameter. And conversely, by winding this one in and this one in, you can uh, close it down a little bit, which is what we're going to do, uh, maybe slightly uh, abusing the, the die. Um, so what you would normally do is you'd make a cut with the die, I think, and then you would go back with it slightly tighter, which would just uh, tidy up the cut. I'm sure there are other ways of doing it. So on our bit of metal, which I've lost, we could try this in the lathe, but again, in that watchmaker's lathe, this is just going to spin round and damage the collet. I filed a couple of flats on here so we can hold it in the vise. And um, so I might just try the little vise so you can see what's going on. And um, I'm going to try and cut a thread and close down, close down, close down that die, and then do what I said last week, which is kind of chase that thread because we've got the right pitch then with a three square needle file uh, and um, continue. But then we've got another trick up our sleeve, um, something wrong with the color temperature today, either that or I'm just looking like incredibly ill. I don't know whether that's coming across on YouTube or not, but the uh, camera's got some kind of auto color temperature thing going on. Anyway, new camera on its way too eventually. Um, yeah, just talk a bit about metal, if that's all right. We'll just go uh, usually off piste. I made this out of EN1A, which is mild steel. So it's got about 0.1 or thereabouts, maybe it's 0 0.12, 0 0.15 um, uh, carbon in it. And that's kind of a, de a, a defining fact, uh, factor or feature of mild steels that they've typically got 0 0.1 or less uh, carbon in them. Most mild steels have got some carbon in them. And if you want uh, iron or pure iron, then you have to get a specialist iron, for instance, if you're making uh, an electromagnet or something, um, which is a different thing. So this is just EN1A. Now I thought it had lead in it to make it free cutting, but it doesn't seem to do from what I can see. It's got silicon in it and uh, something else as well, which you might remember in a minute. So that's like mild steel, which is probably as close as we're gonna get to whatever the pendulum rod is made out of. So we've got no problem there with, uh, with strength, but I thought it's a good opportunity to talk about the other kinds of steel we're likely to come across uh, that you might want to use in your clock repairs. So I've got um, three of them here and to the uh, like first glance, um, they look very similar apart from the fact they've actually written on one of them what they are. But uh, again, without banging on about the past, it's possible <laughs> too much. Uh, did I mention the book? Um, to just quite easily tell the difference between these uh, steels. I've read a lot of people, or you will read, people say you can do it with a spark test on an um, offhand grinder or grinding wheel by looking at the colour and the uh, nature of the spark. I've never been able to tell the difference between them, but I'm sure it can be done. So what we've got here, we've got um, the mild steel. That's the, I'm sorry, we've got the mild steel even. That's the one that we've actually cut the bit of metal off to make our pendulum. And you can see this has got quite a nice bright uh, finish to it. In fact, I think they even call it bright finish. And that's as opposed to that stuff that's black, which I think is hot rolled that you get down the DIY uh, shop, which has got this kind of carburized or uh, black finish on it, which is quite difficult to cut through. So if you're buying mild steel for clockwork, then you want this stuff uh, bright finish. The second one we've got is this, which you maybe can't see on the camera, but it's got a nice uh, ground finish. This is uh, what they call silver steel, which of course has got no silver in it whatsoever, 
but it has got uh, about 0.1%, I think, carbon in it. So this is uh, effectively a tool steel that you can harden really hard to what they call glass hards if you're making a scriber or a punch or some tool that really needs to either resist wear or be very hard. Then silver steel, it might be a way to go. The problem with silver steel is it's a pig to machine. It's kind of really sticky when it's in its annealed state, which is how you buy it. So silver steel, um, don't try and kind of mill. If you ever get around to million pinions, don't mill it out of silver steel because it's really terrible material to machine unless you've got sort of big industrial machining. And then this thing uh, is uh, called EN8DM, I think this is. And this is kind of halfway house between the two. So this is a carbon steel, about 0.4% carbon. And again, it's got silicon in it and not magnesium. Um, welcome to me. You'll, you'll, you'll let me know first before... Um, uh, before I remember what it is. And um, so this is a free cutting mid carbon steel. So it's hardenable. So if you were going to make a clock, you would make, I think, the pinions out of this. You can buy steel that's already hardened and tempered. I think that one of those uh, types is EN24, but this is in its annealed state. So you cut it, machine it, mill it or whatever, and then you harden and temper it which can cause problems with that kind of fire staining and distortion. But um, EN8 is useful if you want something that's got a bit more tensile strength and a bit more machinable than mild steel. So there you go. A little... About the composition, yes, yes, please. Yeah, what is it that's in steel? It's got carbon in it, obviously. It's got uh, silicon in it and it's got not cadmium, um, not selenium, something else. Yes, please, that'd be a good one. Um, so uh, going back to our little um, chap here, let's get the vice. It, normally, if you've got a bigger lathe, you do this in the lathe, the three jaw chuck or something, and you use a drilling tailstock or a die hole to tailstock to keep the whole thing square. But for sake of this um, so called demonstration, <laughs> we will just use our bench vise and our die. So let's just start with the die in a kind of relaxed position. It looks pretty relaxed there, doesn't it? Won't be in a minute. Might actually get a screwdriver that fits as well. Anyway, so this isn't going to be particularly square. Actually, it's not going to be bad because there's already a lot of the spigot that um, that goes in there. I'm not going to use any kind of tapping fluid or anything on here. It's such a short bit of material. And I do wonder whether going to cut up to the shoulder. So what I'm going to do is I'll take a cut, I'll close the die in, I'll take another cut, and then let's see how it looks in relation to fitting it into the uh, slide. So undo that, tighten that up a little bit, tighten that, badger up a bit. Yeah, oh, well, that's starting to uh, do something. So in the third cut, I'll probably tighten it down as much as it can go because uh, we don't have much to deal with there anyway. Well, this is going to definitely give us a start. I know what you're all saying. If you'd have just tapped out to M4 or something or 8th Whitworth Matthew, we'd have had it done years ago and we'd all be down the pub um but uh to uh, duty bound to say that's not quite the point uh, i'll just give it one last tweak but i think the die is about as tight as it will go 
Yeah, if you're doing this under kind of non-demonstration, then use a roll call. Um, you can buy that either a, a liquid uh, cutting fluid, um, which I think is by Ambacil or somebody. And I've not found that so good. I found the best stuff, but it makes everything completely yucky. So you've got to clean everything afterwards. It's just the usual roll call with a little hole in the top of the can and a small paintbrush in there. Um, or if you're cutting a lot, then just trail, you know, something like turning. I just trail a bit of paraffin on the work as it's turning with a with a small brush. And I find that's enough. Um, for this clock stuff, and again, some of you are maybe from engineering backgrounds, you kind of, I've never really felt the need for having sort of suds, you know, a cutting fluid like you do with an industrial machine. So you're not taking that sort of super heavy cuts. Right, let's try it again. Oh, you never know. This might actually be uh, remarkably successful. Who knows? I'm only doing that backing off and breaking the thread thing because you're all watching. Uh, it's what they taught us at school, but I never normally do that. Yes, sir. sometimes maybe. Right, that's about as tight as the dial goes, so uh, we're not going to get any more out of it. Um, mm, partly, partly successful. So you can see there, we've got a... Uh, let's just zoom in a bit, that's a bit better. So we've got the beginning of a thread. Um, I'm not sure that's going to give us enough to work on. Let's just have a. Mm. It's not great. Let's just try it in the slide and see what it looks like. No, the threaded part doesn't um, surprisingly come down uh, far enough to get a start there. So um, what I can do now is I can either try and continue that thread down with my file. That might be uh, so-called fun for a few minutes, but I think as it's coming up, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll continue with this until uh, seven o'clock, then we'll have a wee comfort break. And then um, we might have to abandon this and go on to screw plates. So hopefully all this uh, process is good for you because you know it's, it's our sort of time here when you face these uh, challenges in your own workshop. So what I'm gonna do now is put the um, little spigot in the lathe and just try and replicate that thread, get the, because basically what we're talking about here is the, a helix angle, I suppose, if we can just copy that. You could actually just file across. If I hadn't have uh, cut it off, it was still on the original bit of stock. You could just file across on a bit of boxwood or a, something like that, the, the correct helix angle. Now we've established that 0.7 millimeter sort of pitch, and that would actually cut its own thread as you moved it in and out. So all sorts of ways, as we said last week, but we won't, we, we won't spend too much time on it. Just another few minutes. So I'll get the lathe back out and uh, find a file. Trying to get my hand in there. Let's just move out a bit. Good, you can see. And Put that back in there. Yeah, actually, if, if this was still fixed on the stock, you could just, obviously, again, if you've got a bigger lid, you could just turn up a little spigot again. You could, um, um, you could just uh, do it on a piece of wood, and that would probably do it. Um, I don't know if anybody out there is a Myford um, owner, but is the standard Myford gearbox, does it have a pitch that would do this? 
could you do it on a Myford screw cutting lathe? You could probably do it with the change wheels, but you know, the one with the knot and gearbox on it, that would be quite interesting to, uh, to know. Anyway, I'll spend a few minutes and just have a little fiddle with this and see how it goes. So speaking of being organized, one of the very, very, very few things we've done is um, actually got, can't really see them there, but uh, gotten my needle files organized so they're not all rattling about, which I'm very, very, very happy about. Um, got quite a few more files to do. Just actually. A minute. Our all day uh, proposal. James has got my bridge ML seven. Okay. And he's got more children. What um it's got a I think those gearboxes are an imperial, aren't they? What would that does he know off the top of his head what that would give him? Would it allow him to do this? The 0.7 pitch? I think that's what he's doing, yeah. All right, good. Yeah, the old Mifey is uh, incredibly useful and versatile machine. So all I really need to do here is just to make sure that they, um, the thread remains, uh, the file remains at about the right helix angle. And I'll just follow. I'm using a file here with one completely safe edge because I want it to really cut in. As you can see, it's got one completely safe edge. So I'll need to turn around. So that's cutting on the right hand side of the thread. So I'm going to turn and do it that way as well. That's going to cut on the left hand side of the thread. We'll need to go this way we now, I think. Hmm. No, that needs to be at that angle, doesn't it, underneath? fraction too much my brain to uh, comprehend. I'll stop trying to be clever and <laughs> just do it on top. My father's like his brain is obviously pretty severe limitations. what I should do 
is to protect the bed of my poor old lathe, which um, needs some kind of machine tool award for long service. I'll save you the pain of sitting through this, but I'm amazed that it's actually working quite well in the sense of the, the file, the, the thread where the die had actually cut is um, getting deeper. The problem is the bit where the, uh, the, the die hadn't cut at all is, um, is uh, problematic. So as this is a bit of an experiment and I said I'd stop in my at seven o'clock, I'm gonna cut this off and um, Should really get the graver on that, shouldn't I? And So you can see there the principle of it that uh, it's by no means super smart, but what we've done is we've turned that bigger thread into a smaller thread and you can see you could continue like that. And yeah, it's never gonna be, as I said, super, super smart, but it will uh, work if I can just see. There you see, bit wonky. But it does actually screw on there. It's um, it's beginning, uh, but needs more work. So what I'm going to do is I might go back to screw plates next week, believe it or not, and uh, pursue that way. Or I might just continue with this and see if I can just make it um, uh, a bit straighter. Because it tends to be easier to retap the thread in the rod. Yeah, it would be. It would be Derek to retap the thread in the rod, but. Uh, that's what I'm trying to avoid at all costs. Yeah, we, we could have done that. Um, and it's a, it's a fair point. And of course, if you're working in the kind of restoration world, you have to balance these things. Uh, my kind of point here is that, uh, and maybe it's a thing that's pretty specific to the kind of work I do normally, um, but this kind of effort or this kind of thinking, if you like, uh, you can get some really interesting conservation type jobs that you would never get if, um, if if you were to do that so and it's kind of tricky because you without going off um, on yeah another tangent you you I see people uh, advertise and they say oh yeah I do conservation and restoration and I don't believe it for one minute because um, of course, as we say on the Facebook group the whole time and everywhere, it's not actually about the doing, it's about the thinking. And um, it's, I think it's really difficult and you get compromised if you say one day, oh, I'll, um, nothing wrong in putting a new thread in there at all, I'm not against it. But if, if I would say I've never put a new thread in a historic clock for the past sort of, I don't know, 10, 15 years or something. Um, so matching threads and you get a lot of faff like this. I think the screw plates is probably the way to go. But, you know, um, that's in our second book. That's the first time I've mentioned the second book. We're going to call it developing practice. And uh, it's, as I said, you know, it's the usual thing that the doing and the accumulating of the tools and the skills and all that stuff is about half the energy. In fact, when you get more established, 
It's less than half the energy. It's the thinking and saying we could do this, we could do that. Uh, how do we work towards that um, end? That's our kind of challenge. So long answer. So the answer is yes, you could uh, tap it out to eight Whitworth or M4 or whatever it is you happen to have. And that would make life uh, a lot quicker. But I'm particularly interested in that other world where it's worth your while to, I mean, normally commercially you wouldn't spend ages doing this, but say spend an hour making a screw or a quarter day figuring out a problem. And sometimes, of course, you only end up saving a tiny, tiny bit of work. One particular case, again, uh, tangents of what this is about, is I once worked on, um, I think it was for Leeds Temple Newsham House or somebody like that. There was a spinning wheel, a decorative, but um, you useful and usable 18th century spinning wheel by some famous maker. Don't know anything about them. And it had worm gears in it and the worm wheel had stripped. And I went to a lot of trouble to save as much of the wheel as I could. It would have been 10 times easier just to cut a new one. Um, but I went through this kind of process and you know, it, that's how you get that kind of work if that kind of work is of interest. Right, little uh, three minute comfort break till 10 past, and then we will jump in, he says, not exactly jumping in, to the clock movement. I'm gonna make a list of things that we uh, might need doing to it. Uh, so we can start to think about processes and materials and timelines and all that kind of thing. And also it's what you do if you're preparing an estimate for a client. So we'll come back at 10 past.
Right, welcome back. Remember this, our little clock. Uh, I'm gonna sit down for this, I think. Oh, yeah, why not indeed? Press my weary legs. There we are. Okay, lots of stuff in there. Right, well, as you can see, uh, we've got overall um, sort of regular sort of cleaning. Um, we've got dust, uh, surface dust, a little bit of surface rust, which looks probably quite bad on the camera, but actually it's that's the least of our uh, problems. So let's just work through a few of the things that we're going to have to tackle over the forthcoming uh, few weeks till we get this ticking. Um, there are bits missing from this clock, so there are no hands, no seconds hand, no minute hand, no hour hand. So I think I will actually do that sort of towards the end as a bit of treat, a bit of a dog treat for me uh, for doing the whole thing. Um, because we can probably just put a sort of collet on here and get the thing running, get the friction working and have it up and on test in the case, the case did some work. So anyway, so hands, that's uh, the first thing on our list. Uh, let's in fact, get an actual list and I can type it up. I'll take some, I think there are photographs of this already on Facebook, but if I get the chance, I'll take some kind of uh, close up. Let's start from book two on bushing and thing is nearly ready, yeah. Um, um, yeah, bushing and depth thing. We are getting there. Been saying that for about six months now. Right, okay, I'll just make a bit of a scruffy old list here, but it'll get us started. And of course, this is what you'd have to do if you were um, doing an estimate for this clock. So we need uh, hands. So it didn't really matter where we start. Um, I don't think there's any particular sort of mechanical problem with this. It's gonna cause us a problem. It's just a lot of faff and uh, making a couple of repairs and things. So uh, let's just have a look in here. What have we got? Can you hear that sound effect? I was something to do with lack of lubrication, I think. But what we can see from this is that uh, there don't appear to be any broken uh, teeth or missing pinion leaves. And the escape wheel is running really true. The extended front pivot's a bit wobbly where the second's hand pipe is, but actually the train, considering it's not been uh, oiled for at least 30 years, as far as we know it, is fine. And again, we can have a look at the great wheel teeth here. And again, they, uh, they look fine. I haven't seen any of the clocks being bent or anything. That's definitely something worth looking at. We've got some more live stream <laughs> rusty, long case clock movements and one of them has been dropped on the floor so the frame is kind of parallelogrammed and the rivets are broken so uh, that's kind of a much more major issue but this the frame on this looks sound the um, pillars are not broken through or being broken off where somebody's driven the pins in the winding arbors look nice and neat and square they don't appear to be badly burred uh, it's got some bushing um, which, uh, yeah, we'll see what that looks like, but I very, very much doubt it'll need any more bushing. And same on the back plate, it looks really sound. Uh, some bushing here. Now this is kind of quite interesting with, um, get rid of that. Uh, with thinking about bushing and depthing a lot, what do you do if you've got what you think is ugly bushing? And again, without going back to the conversation about the bottom of the pendulum rod and all that stuff, um, you know, the, the priority for me is, as I've said before, is it likely 
within a reasonable period, whatever that is, to be safe for the object, as in, is it something that's going to cause more damage? For instance, a classic example is a winding click that's not working properly. Uh, that could not only um, cause teeth to get broken off or an arbor to get broken, it could cause the weight to hit the floor and cause damage, but it could also damage the person who's winding its fingers with the key spinning around and so on. So that would be like a priority. Something like this bushing, when we get round to that, um, so I don't love to be particularly uh, in focus, but um, if it's sound and it's doing the job okay, I don't care personally that it might be regarded as some people as being ugly or poor workmanship, because I'm not really making a judgment about that. Again, as I said before, um, there is enough clocks in the world to fix without uh, looking for more work. So that doesn't bother me, doesn't ring an alarm, any alarm bells with me. That's not the kind of thing that's going to cause us problems in this clock. If there's anything else there to see. Uh, obviously, the bell stand that is broken off, but as Jane reminded us a few weeks ago, the bell has been fixed on the backboard of the case. And as long as that's sound again, it's not going to fall off and break the bell. I'm perfectly happy with that. I don't think in this case I'm going to silver solder on a bit of steel. Could do and um, bend it round or forge it and cut a thread on the end. You could go down that route, but I don't really see what um, advantage that gives us. And also the repair that I love those kind of make do and mend repairs that people do. Uh, some people call it bodgery, but um, it's just the bell standard obviously got broken um top tip when you're transporting a clock and you lie it on its dial I, that's the way i do it with paper behind the hands and things um take the bell off because the bell standard could easily uh, snap up it sort of gets work hardened so there are things that are all right i mean there's surprisingly little kind of wrong so i've got the click but there's a good example look um the click isn't working now, I think that's only because it's got rusted off. It's got rust rusted in the off position. I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with the spring. I reckon once we've had that apart and we've cleaned it and oiled it, it'll be good to go. But obviously in its present state, that's uh, no good whatsoever. Let's just have a look at the side. Yeah. Um, if you ever get into doing training for people who wind clocks, say in historic houses or something, this is one of the key points. They must listen to, obviously, we know this as clocks people, but if you're new to it, they must listen to the click. Because again, this one, because it's a bit rusty and a bit dirty, uh, is indistinct, which of course is like, you know, disastrous potentially. But I, again, the spring looks fine. I don't see any previous repairs on it. Um, often the springs are touching the, uh, the great wheel. It wants moving away a bit. That's going to cause problems with the spring. Same thing for hammer springs. This spring in here, um, in there, look. Uh, sometimes you see here it's clear of the plate, but it shouldn't be touching the plate. Often they are, and that's going to cause you a problem as well. Interesting in terms of what screws go where on this clock. Don't if you notice, but the hammer spring screw there has got a lovely point on it, which is really nice. So we must make a note of that to try and put that back in that position. Not that that's necessarily where it was when it was new, of course, we, we don't know, but um, it's just a nice thing to note. So I'll just kind of working round in some random way a good idea, of course, again, if you're new to this, to make a kind of checklist uh, so you don't miss anything. And so when you get into the repair, you think, oh, blimey, I missed that. And it's a day's work that I'm not charging for. One thing that often happens is this bush here, which is one of the few that um, actually I usually pay a bit of attention to, but in this case, I think it's fine, wears. And as this bush wears, it wears out and up and as it wears out and up the combined rack spring and hammer stop becomes less and less and less effective so the hammer rotates 
and you'll often see the hammer in this case it's not going to happen but often uh, actually bearing on this pillar here and it rattles like crazy and it sounds pretty bad so there's a kind of easy fix for that and that is simply to obviously to push this bearing here at the back which moves it back to conjectured sort of earlier position but often that's not enough because some wear has taken place here so what I do is I take a bit of shim brass about 0.3 or something and just kind of like tack it on the top with soft soga you know a little neat repair and it just takes up that gap and it means that when the hammer uh, comes to rest it's uh, pretty much as a rule of thumb I would say that this part of the hammer shank here wants to be pretty much um, parallel with the edge of the plate so you can see that it's moved in a little bit it's nice if it looks like that but I personally I wouldn't worry too much you can see if we maybe push that down with our pointing stick and it, um, yeah. So you can't oil it properly if the bushing is sticking out. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. I, I think you can. Sorry to sound uh, <laughs> argumentative. Can you oil it properly if the bushing is sticking out? Well, this clock has got quite decent sized oil sinks. So remember, oil sinks have got very little to do with holding oil. That's not what they're for. Um, what they are for is a complete mystery, frankly. But if you fill an oil sink with oil, is that the, is that the point? Uh, it just runs down the plate. Yes, admittedly, you can have a little bit of a reservoir of oil in there, but typically the oil won't kind of go around the corner anyway. So that, that wouldn't bother me here. I mean, what would bother me is if the bush is loose, um, it wasn't uprighted properly. And obviously we don't know what the condition of this uh, pivot is. Now, this is where, you have to obviously you all make your own decisions and <clears throat> we make we all make our different decisions but this is where there's a lot of pushback from people who say it's bodgery it's terrible work i don't know what terrible work is we know kind of what good work is but it, again just purely personally professionally if that bush is sound in the plate um, people have told me that the bush, the pivot wears inside the bush and it moves forward. And yeah, I, I can see that that would happen. But it looks here actually like um, that the pivot actually comes to the end of the bush anyway. If it was buried right inside, then maybe, but uh, that doesn't, um, doesn't bother me, uh, I'm afraid to say. What is interesting, another thing, highly controversial subject, is that you can see here, um, you can see in there, get some light in there, that the it looks like the warning wheel front pivot has broken off. And rather than repivoting it, somebody shortened the arbor, so they put an extended bush in there. Now, again, that doesn't bother me one bit. Some people go totally ballistic over that and say, oh, it's bodgery, cut the arbor off, drill it out. Absolutely fine. I don't have a problem with doing it that way. But if this pivot here is reasonably sound, reasonably parallel and all right, reasonably concentric, and the bush is sound, I don't personally have a problem uh, leaving it. I'm, I'm not interested in... Um, conjecturally undoing what might be called bad work but I can see for instance um, if you were in retail uh, that if somebody bought a clock and it's I don't know 10 20 30 100 500,000 whatever that I can imagine that there's an amount of pressure there to have that put back and I hear this time and time and time again in terms of so-called restoration the reality is you can't put it back. Yes, you could drill out the arbor and put a new piece in and put a bush that's flushed with a plate and it would look neater. Um, but for me, that's just more change. It's more work. It's more cost on the invoice. Maybe with a case like that, I would say to the client, OK, so we've got to drill this out. If we've got a, a lathe, we can hold it reasonably easily. It's going to take, let's say, an hour to extend the pivot and half an hour to uh, sort out the bushing so it's another hour and a half on the um on the invoice and you know I don't really frankly care either way uh, and with this bushing uh it's 15 20 minutes to pop a new bush in there 
Um, so again, you could do that and it would look a bit neater. What I would be really uh, cautious about though, is damaging the surrounding, um, surrounding material on the plate. So again, there is no right or wrong answer to this. Of course, my view uh, is, is just that it's my view. And the whole point of this is a kind of dialogue, although um, uh, a, a, it's a bit of a one way street. I'm sorry, but at least there's the, the live chat there. So yeah, that doesn't bother me unless it's going to cause a problem. As I said before, it's going to cause a problem for the clock or it's going to cause a, like a personal injury problem. So let's write that on the list. The, um, let's just have a little look at the concentricity of that. It's difficult to say until we get it apart. Just have a look through our eyeglass. Sorry, I'll just nick your clock. Mm. I mean, in terms of depthing with a fly, it looks it looks fine, but obviously the whole thing is covered in dust and things. So that's our gathering wheel front pivot question mark, and the other one was the escape rear, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I just think with these things, you know, I, and again, where do you kind of draw the line? Where, where do, I mean, obviously you have everybody's line is in a different place. So is there any more bushing on here that we can look at? Yeah, you see there's one uh, there as well that's uh, sticking out a little bit. So that's pinwheel front. Um, and what about that? Mm. Oh, that's the one, isn't it, where it's on the sticking on the inside. So that's going to be a bit of a challenge with oiling not that you can't get oil in there but it's this idea that the pivot wears down inside the hole i did see on another forum somebody going totally crazy about that and saying you've got to do this got to do that there is no got to do uh regrettably anyway so i just noticed here the fly spring has um so if, again for people who are new to uh clock repair like this Common uh, problem with these is that this is a clutch, essentially. So what happens possibly when the train begins to strike, but definitely when the train stops, is that to dissipate energy, the fly, this uh, flat brass blade, continues to rotate on its arbor. And eventually the spring, which is brass here, uh, looks like steel, but I think it's brass, wears away. And it's ever so easy to bend it back and then it breaks through. So what happens is this the person who put this clock together fed it round the back of the uh, arbor, which I again, I don't care that that would be seen by some people as bad practice. But I think uh, what we'll find is it just doesn't work properly. So um, if that friction uh, disappears, then what happens is the clock starts striking like crazy, like dung, dung, dung and the client rings up and it doesn't do the clock any good. Or conversely, if that spring is too strong and it doesn't slip, then when the train locks, you get wear on specific teeth because they're always in the same place. So definitely a uh, fly spring is something I would look at. And also making a new fly spring is quite a nice little exercise, but you know, there's always a compromise with this. So between the plates, I can't really see anything else. We'll come back to the escapement, um, the pallets. I can say we've got pallets for this clock. We have got pallets for this clock, phew. Um, and let's just look at the uh, front plate now. So the first and obvious thing is that the hour pipe is broken off. Now this is actually quite a, an easy repair. Again, if you have got that lovely Myford lathe sat in the corner, then you are laughing because uh, what I do here, let's just write it on the list. Um, Sam says, do you have any idea when the bushes were fitted, whereby style, punch uh, is an earlier tool or used consecutively or just poor practice? I think, pun yeah, again, I don't think punches are poor practice. I think they're just something that people did. Um, remember that, uh, 
probably actually now, but as recently as the 1960s, people were actively throwing these clocks away because they were so worthless and out of fashion. I've heard stories um, that of people just burning the cases and chucking the movements away. And so, you know, a repair for that. And frankly, if we were going to start um, digging into it, punching up a hole. The problem with punching up a hole for me um, is that people don't do it anymore. I don't do it either, obviously. Um, is that you can kind of only do it once or twice and the plate gets so thin that you've got to rebush. However, from one perspective, um, pushing it a little bit, uh, of course, you're not removing all that material that you have to do when you put a bush in. You know, a bush is seen as a repair process, but it's actually also a destructive process because you can't insert a bush without actually reaming or broaching out some material from the host plate. Now, those... Um, little spring loaded punches that we call naughty punches that come in sets i think they're a kind of post-war mid-20th century thing that you would get from your clock material dealer so i think we the, the uh, punching that goes the whole way around the pivot and of course the crazy thing about those is that they don't really help with the depthing problem people think uh, i think i don't know uh, what people think but let's just say that people think that by closing the hole you're uh, bringing the depth in back to some optimal position. I'm not sure that a lot of people make the connection between depthing and bushing. Maybe I'm being unfair. So those punches that close the hole, yeah, they'll move the pivot back a bit, but at best it's going to be 50%, is that right, between the one position and the optimal position, given that the optimal position was the uh, original position. Um, so if you see the circular marks, I think they're 20th century. The, um, a, a lot of the clocks that you see, see, particularly great wheel bearing holes, are so unworn. Uh, the problem is that people bush them with those high zinc bushes, which wear out massively rapidly anyway. Um, that are probably, let's say, for 100, 150 years, even with constant use, clocks didn't need bushing. So I think it's a, a totally uninformed answer to your question, Sam. I think the answer is that what we see, the vast majority of it is 20th century, um, I think. But um, I, I don't know. Uh, obviously, I don't know. That kind of bushing where it's done presumably with hand tools and things probably predates the sort of 60s and 70s where things like bushing tools came into uh, play and you get those um, pre-made bushes that some people use. Uh, these are not them. So I guess this probably is early 20th century stuff, but I don't know. It's a good subject for uh, yet another research thesis. So I think, uh, where were we? Right, um, oh, our wheel pipe, that was it. So you've got a lathe. What I would do with that, I'll put it on the list, it's already on the list, is to turn a bit of wood in a three jaw chuck and make a, a reference kind of holder, screw this down with a couple of wood screws with washers behind them, concentric with the axis of the lathe. And then you can solder on, make a support, a tapered wooden support to, because we've got, we've got the hour wheel pipe. Um, somewhere in one of the many, there it is, bags. So we've got the hour wheel pipe, and luckily, I think it survived okay. Um, but it's really nice. So this is tapered, remember. Um, very little in clocks is uh, kind of parallel uh, arbors, you know, a lovely cutting brooch. So it's bigger on this end than it is on this end. So if you took this off, put it in a lathe with um, a center and a piece of wood up the inside or something, you could, come on, rack arm, get out of the way. Uh, rack arm, by the way, not rack tail. Rack tail is down there, controversially. All controversy, controversy tonight, isn't it? Uh, you could soft solder this back on, and there's just about enough room in there between the cannon pipe and the uh, hour wheel bridge to maybe turn a piece of brass that goes on the inside just to support it. Of course, this part of the cannon pipe has got to get through that hole, so you can't make it so small. But well, we don't have that facility available to us, so the question is going to be, how do we solder that on or how do we repair it or make a new one or whatever. 
um, and keep it square to the work because if it isn't square to the work, the hour hand will be cocked up at one side and then further towards the dial at the other side. So that needs some thinking about. Many ways to skin a cat. Um, the all-time favourite, let's just go in here a bit closer. Um, the rack spring, good old rack spring. We could talk for hours about this. Um, most interesting subject on the planet. Like at least 50%, if not more, of long case clocks have had some work or some change, alteration, intervention to the rack spring. Um, so taking me at my word <laughs> um, from before, is it safe for the clock? Is it safe for the person? Um, although this rack spring, I think it's steel. I haven't had a close enough look at it yet. Um, it's soft soldered on there. You could argue that, you know, I, I think actually it's going to work. Um, I obviously need straightening up and all that kind of stuff. It's difficult to see here how it was originally fixed on the frame. Um, Okay, so it looks, we'll have to have a closer look when we get the frame apart. Um, it looks like it was screwed on and the screw sheared off in the hole. Somebody's over tightened it or whatever. And then in a separate um, train smash, then it's been soldered on. But because it's been soldered on when it's on the front plate, soft soldered, thankfully not brazed, it's really difficult to get enough heat in there. So it looks like it's kind of floating about on the surface. But if I get a pair of tweezers, I think it's time for a vote, don't you, Rachel? Yes. What's the question? Team, uh, Team Open Clock Club says uh, it's time for a vote. <laughs> um, so I don't know how many people are watching. Um, Thank you. Leave it or um, do something else. Uh, get get the spring off there. Try get the foot off there. Make a screw that matches the thread. Remember, that's going to take us ages, but it's perfectly fine. We can do it. And then make a new uh, uh, rack spring here. So the thing about replacement rack springs, and uh, sorry to labour the point, but it's such um, from a clock repair perspective. Uh, if anything's important, of course, an important point is they're often replaced far too strong. And the problem with that is um, when the rack drops, particularly in the long hours, 10, 11, 12, whatever, the rack arm, pin on the rack arm hits on the snail and it does it with such vigor that it breaks a rivet here eventually. You often see this rivet has been redone and then you're into a whole new set of problems. So this spring, should within reason be as long as possible uh, and also tapered. When we talked earlier on Facebook, the spring shouldn't be parallel, it should be tapered. And so this means that when it deflects, it bends evenly along its length. Um, as uh, my old tutor used to say, think of a tree branch, you know, it's thinner at the end than it is at the bit where it joins onto the thick bit which sticks in the ground. And uh, it's shaped like that for a reason and make your springs like that. Don't make them out of parallel material, unless it's a modern, more modern clock, which in case parallel material was used. But for these, get a bit of a hard brass wire and file the thing to a taper first and then decide how you're going to join it onto the foot. Um, Ian says do something else. Don't leave it as it is. Yeah. Yeah. Don't leave it as it is. Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right good well we that gives us a chance to muck about making a new screw because i think that's what it's gonna need and then make a bit of uh brass and then think how we're gonna fix it into this foot because i think the foot's okay yeah it's hidden under that bit of wire and soft shoulder uh, but i think the foot's all right so what we we'll probably have to do is to drill into the edge of the foot and it's quite thin sometimes they're quite a thick casting here it's quite thin I'll dovetail our wire in, soft solder it in, and then um, put a new piece of wire in there. So that's like about six weeks 
of uh, live stream work alone. <laughs> so we're going to be going on this project right into the, the summer. Anyway, maybe if you log off and log back on in a year's time, I'll just be getting around to that. So uh, Rack Spring, we're going to uh, intervene there. So that's a nice kind of compromise, really, between maybe things like the bushing that we might leave and the rack spring that we might intervene with just to kind of see how those things work out because you really don't know until you kind of look, look at them in the rear view mirror and then afterwards of course you think that's why practice develops this is why in my view not that anybody was asking it's so dangerous to say there's a right way to fix a clock or a right way to do anything or it's not workmanlike and other such expressions um, because the minute that you say that, something comes along to uh, defeat you. Let's just get our, um, our wheel here. Oh. Well, <laughs> okay. All right, we'll do something, but I would... Ian says you need to practice after you. I do need the practice. I, I totally need the practice. I've only done about 300 rack springs. Um, I'm perfectly, perfectly happy to do it. But again, I don't know personally what a mess looks like. Um, I, I think that's an interesting question. Anyway, let's not go there. Um, just reminded me before we move on to other things uh, about this 24 hour wheel in here. Now, uh, some of you might know this, were these clocks made with kind of universal parts? Um, so this clock doesn't have a subsidiary uh, moon mechanism or date. It's got a date ring thing, a disc, but it's driven by that pin there. It's not driven by the 24 hour wheel. Um, so uh, what my question is, is it reasonable that this clock was made as a standard unit. Remember, it's got that um, false plate, so the dial and the movement was kind of, you know, they didn't start life together, they were matched together. That this 24 hour wheel is the right thing for this clock, right thing, he said, using temporary advisory, because we've got the stud for the, um, not 24 hour wheel, sorry, this isn't a 24 hour, we've got the stud for the 24 hour wheel missing and a wheel cutting thing, which is in another life. For some mechanism that doesn't even exist on this clock so that's my question is were these clocks made like this or is that dial and this movement associated um anyway i've got no idea and again i don't personally actually really mind but um it's kind of quite interesting so this is nice sometimes these are made as separate components so there's a boss a wheel and this assembly on the front and there's a slip washer on the back if you saw the work we did on that clock by Henry Hindley. This isn't quite as posh as that, uh, but nevertheless, it's nice and it hasn't been um, kind of gotten up too much. We might be able to see some evidence of wear on that wheel. If we can, then obviously we know that it's been used. And also we might be able to look very closely at this and see whether there's a stud being screwed in that hole because often people put uh, pliers or something on them and uh, you get a little mark around there. More paint splats, so that's quite nice. Jody says, would it have been brass originally? Oh, the rack spring, yes. Yeah, rack spring brass. Yeah, probably one piece filed from solid or probably from a casting. Nowadays, it seems so difficult to get these small castings done, but on the underdell work of like 18th century English quarter striking clocks, you get those nice little casters, one uh, springs, and that's probably what it would have been here. Uh, so yeah, it would have been brass. Um, you do obviously get steel springs uh, in continental work, and I'm sure in English work as well, but pretty sure this would have been brass. And of course, what you've got here is a bit of steel. So you, wherever possible, you want that combination of brass on steel. You don't want steel on steel or brass on brass. You want dissimilar uh, materials. So luckily, our rack arm uh, looks good. Uh, the pin is there at the back. It's got its kind of safety action there. And uh, that's obviously happened relatively recently, that scratchy mark. But it's difficult to see with all the gunge on there, but whether the... Oh, yeah, there are marks there. Look, you can just about see 
maybe again that's quite uh, modern, but where the uh, the hands have been pushed around. So presumably that happened when the clock had hands on it. So it's been there um, at least uh, kind of thirty years or more. So for the hand that we're going to make, just an observation, it just pushes on to the hour pipe there. You can see it's tapered and it'll be a little bit cut away, but there's no... Oh, it's nice. Um, there's no um, spring and no uh, slip washer or pins or screw or locating pin just pushes on, which is really cool. And there's a little mark there, a file mark, uh, where presumably where 12 goes, is that where 12 goes? Uh, no, it's not. So there's a random kind of mark there. Anyway, moving on. So uh, Rack Spring, Our Wheel Bridge, and then probably the most difficult repair in the whole clock is the gathering pallet. I've never seen this before, but this clock has got like a crazy long, gathering pallet. So let's copy right in. Um, and you can see there, so normally this gathering pallet is like half that length. It's bonkers. I suppose you don't get a lot of um, locking friction with it being that long because it's a larger radius. Uh, but don't quite, other than that, I don't quite know what the uh, advantage maybe it's just a kind of um, manufacturer's uh, design anybody else seen that before it is literally like twice as long as normal um, but the problem is she's problem the as always or often is the case the pin hole has broken through uh, why who knows somebody pushed the pin in but anyway the pin's broken through the end of the ab has broken off uh, somebody spilled up the hole with a uh, soft solder by the look of it uh, I don't think it's braze. I hope it's not braze. No, it's um, soft solder. And the problem with that is that it's become loose on a square. And with a gathering pallet or anything that fits on a square, if it's loose, it will just get worse and it'll get a lot worse quite quickly. So if you get something like that component and think, mm, I might get away with it, you won't. It'll just cause a big problem. The minute it gets loose, it's problematic. And what's happened here, which is going to make our life interesting, is uh, you can see, can you see there? It's cracked. So it's cracked um, on both sides. Is it replacement, Jeremy says? The gathering pallet. No, don't think so. No, it's quite worn. And it, I mean, it has to be that long because it, it reaches from, uh, it's, it's that long because this value here is also that long. Uh, so when the, the, the pallet locks, train's a bit reluctant to run. Um, it locks on there. I'd say that's a good point. Very good point, Jeremy, maybe it is. Maybe it is because uh, let's do some counting here. So we've got um, one, if it, if it gathers on the first or last two for the rack. So one, two, three, four, twelve. So that's the one, two, third, two for the actual rack. So it's going to be there where it locks. No, it's it looks okay. Um, no, it's just, I've not seen one, but that's only because I've not fixed enough um, long case clocks. So we've got two things here. Repairing the arbor is not, it's, it's easy again, if you've got a big collet lathe, you can stick it in the back end of a collet or something, drill it out or hard solder a piece on and then turn it down. I'll probably, if you could hold it, drill out the arbor. So rather than, heating it up and silver soldering it here and putting the square on and filing it down. Could do that. Uh, I might actually consider losing this whole part here and drilling out into the bearing and fitting a new piece and filing it up. Obviously, best to keep that if we can, but um, I kind of think that that's going to be more tricky hard soldering. 
We can try the hard solder method first. And if that doesn't work, we can then chop it off and drill out and put another piece in. But this is much more tricky because what you can do here is you can, I if you can see on the back there, it's a bit worn. Uh, so that might cause us a problem. But what you can do is to soft solder a piece of um, watch mainspring in here to take up that wear. That works quite ni ni nicely and is re reasonably reversible. But the problem is that the whole thing with it flopping about on the square has got baggy. So um, that's tricky. We could try, uh, you'd have to saw down here to clean up this cr crack, close it up best possible, put some silver solder on it or braze or something, and then try refiling the square. I'm not sure how successful that's going to be. It might be all right. Um, the hole or the whole thing. I think I, I don't think it's later. It might be Jeremy. Uh, one, two, one, two, three. So that's the position at which it's locked. And yeah, it's on, but it's on the inclined plane there. And because it's locking at such a radius, there's hardly, well, there's, is that a half? Is it linear? I don't know. Um, yeah, it's half, isn't it? So it's half the locking friction that there would be normally. So it's quite possible for that to, to slide off there. I'll just have a little look and see whether you know I can't see any sign of it locking on there I mean maybe it's maybe it's later what is slightly kind of convincing me it's it's about the right dimension and it's uh, the kind of right texture of steel and it's rusted to the same degree so if it's a replacement unless it doesn't actually function I'm pretty happy keeping it um because whatever i would make would look similar now if you make a new one of these you can you've got to start with some material that you can harden so really uh where's our lovely you might actually be better we'd have to get some slightly bigger diameter but making it out of a bit of en8 um you can buy it in square section i think as well but it's one of those things that's easy to buy if you want an articulated lorry full and difficult if you want one, but there is, is it called the Ian Coote who sells that stuff, a horological supplier. Anyway, might make it out of that and just um, drill a hole that's the across that size and then use an escapement, square escapement file to um, file that square on there. Then you'd start with this bit much wider and then you would find out the position at which the hammer lifting piece fell off the pinwheel then you'd mark this and that would describe this uh, angle here. Then you'd cut the rest of it away, then harden it and temper it. Um, if you do it in gauge plate, it's great, but it's just an absolute pig to work with. So I would be uh, tempted to do it in EN8. Or what we could do is if we can't rescue this bit, I'll saw it off here and uh, silver solder on just this little bit here. You could do that. Um, and you'd have a joint at this point, but that could work okay as well. So as always, you know, we've got options. There is no right or wrong way. And I'm sure whichever option we choose, some people will say it's not the right thing. I wouldn't have done it like that, which is great, of course. That's kind of um, uh, kind of where, or the depth, you mean that way, Jeremy? Right, okay. Um, well, it doesn't have to be anything, I mean, yeah. You're right, sometimes they're quite slim like this, but if you imagine it was like a normal length one, it would be about like uh, that, wouldn't it? Got my Westin tweezers there. Um, something like that. That would look okay. This, this part doesn't do anything. All it does is it holds this surface in place so this can be as thick, uh, deep as possible. And it's about the kind of right um, thickness, I think as well. So I'm happy to keep it if it works, but it just depends how much we decide to do here, whether we decide to solve the solid or not. Anyway, gathering pallet, that might be quite a bit down the route because it looks like it's going to be a tricky old uh, thing. I'll put it in our drawer. Anything else? Let's quickly wrap up. I think we're about getting there. Anything else you've spotted? I can't see anything there. 
oh, the center arb is bent, but I think that'll straighten up. It seems to be okay between the plates. So let's just um, get the old pallets out. I think we looked at these before, didn't we? They're a really kind of lovely shape. Nice shape with this sort of geometric top on them. Pivots look fine, they're a little bit rusty, but I'm not gonna worry about that. Uh, but what's happened here, if you can see, is that the crutch loop is broken. Um, I guess the movement's been out of the case and it's got dropped or something. I'll just see if it's been, they've often been repaired sometimes with soft solder and you have to sleeve them with a bit of brass or hard solder. Yeah, it's been repaired. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of classic. I think it has. Yeah, it looks like it's been repaired. And what's worse than soft solder, it looks like it's been hard soldered. So the problem then is that, that our joint will fall apart, no doubt, when we heat it up. But anyway, that will straighten up. And you could, again, uh, being slightly devil's advocate, you could straighten that. And if it will close up, um, under normal circumstances, the amount of uh, pressure on this joint is weeny. You know, it's only got broken because it's been fallen over or something. Um, so you could argue that you could just straighten it all and clean it a bit and leave it as it is. But I think uh, for some kind of peace of mind, <laughs> maybe solder that loop back up with uh, silver solder. So that, that should actually work out quite neatly. Um, pallet faces, a little bete noir, they... They look actually amazingly unworn. So I worry that somebody's done that thing of polishing out the wear, which of course, in my view, as you know, is just another form of wear and it just increases drop. So, but we tackled refacing the pallets, as you know, so we can do that with our eyes closed nowadays if necessary. Come on. Let's just have a look at drop. There's our back cock. Uh, no steady pins, so that uh, I think we mentioned it before it makes our life a little bit easier when it comes to adjusting drop. Uh, this hole here, sometimes this is just cut away underneath uh, the back cock foot, and you've got to be careful not to miss that bearing because uh, it isn't often like this where you can see right through it. You've got miss that bearing when you're oiling because it's hidden underneath the back cock and it's uh, yeah easy to miss it. Um, and also what is also easy with that is that the if the back cock foot is very close to the end of the pivot it can drag the oil often when you take the back cock off what you find is there's all oil underneath there from um let's just put these screws in and we can have a quick look at drop and then i think we'll call that a day so i think next week what i'm going to do is i'm going to either have tackle that pendulum rod thing or I will get get it finished basically. Um, there's a little trick I want to show you in making a, a die uh, to finish up off right to the end of the thread uh, because we'll need to do that to make it neat. Um, but other than that, I think we've about exhausted where we're going with that. So I'll have a look through the screw plates and then make um, a decision as to what to do with that. And not the right screwdriver, I'm sorry, apologize. So let's just have a look at our drop. You can see in there. Yeah, you see that? There's loads of internal drop. I mean, again, some people say, oh, look at the drop on that in some kind of pejorative way. So don't get obsessed by it. But again, here, because that entry, uh, sorry, exit palette is kind of smooth, 
I think what's happened here is that process that we described in Open Clock Club of somebody's polished out the way. I, as, as you can probably tell, I'm pretty <laughs> animated about that because all it does is it just generates more wear. It doesn't actually do any good. Uh, however, um, as I said, what we can do is we can put a slip probably on the exit palette only. So that, get a scape wheel tooth there, slip on there. We can leave it long and we can deal with both drops in one. I reckon that will work out quite nicely. Um, but anyway, let's look at that when we're a little bit further down the road. So we've got some repairs there that are really good fun, like the fly spring, and they'll be quite easy and we can be quite creative. We've got some other repairs that are quite controversial, like the bushing. Um, and then we've got other repairs that are uh, sort of slightly more tricky, like this hour wheel pipe that you have to have done. So they're going to, they would go into our report to our client normally and we'd say it's X hours, Y hours and Z hours. And that's going to cost you uh, so much. I think I've got about, oh, I haven't got the clutch loop on there. We may come across other things when we get the clock apart. So really the next stage on the clock movement is to just do some preliminary cle cleaning so we can see it without the dirt and the spider's webs and old oil. Uh, we'll get a bit of that rust off, um, just like we described in the book. I think that's the fourth time I've mentioned it, so well done me, uh, with a bit of steel wool maybe and paraffin wax or something. And then we can obviously look at those uh, bushes, look at that pivot that's been shortened, that but that's been shortened, and we can add to our list any other things that we find. But um, just wanted to look at there. Yeah. But otherwise, I think we're uh, good to move on to the next stage. So I say next week, we're going to try and put the pendulum rod thing to bed. We can forget about that, wrap it up, and we can dive into the movement wholeheartedly. So as always, big thank you to Open Clock Club um, live stream typing here. So... Uh, uh, yeah, any views on non laminated based cleaner? There's, um, is that the question? Non -based. Yeah, non ammoniated based cleaner. I don't, well, I, I use mineral spirits, so that's what I would call non ammoniated based cleaners, sort of to wash away the um, dust and things, and without dragging it on too much. The beauty of a clock like this is that obviously the brass is uh, tarnished or oxidized or whatever you want to call it which is a passivated layer. So very briefly, both zinc and copper are reactive, as we know, you've all been to the old, uh, or remember the older people amongst us have sat polishing copper kettles and all that stuff. And of course, the problem with that is you polish it and it tarnishes again. You will never win that battle. However, in a regular environment, like we experience in a house like this with central heating, there is um, a state of equilibrium that's reached between the buildup of tarnish and, uh, and the environment. It's not like steel that if it's rusting, it continues to rust till it's completely used up. So for me, that brown stuff is an absolute gift and I want to preserve that at all cost. If, however, you've got a clock where for whatever reason you want to brighten the finish, um, there's a product called Elmer uh, WF Pro, I think it is, that I've used a couple of times. For example, and I wouldn't do this now because I'm more old and more sort of uh, bloody minded than I used to be, but I had a skeleton clock that had been in a fire and it was sort of really, really black. Frankly, I would just wash it like this and leave it black nowadays. However, then 20 years ago, I used this product, Elmer WF Pro, which is a watch cleaning solution non uh, waterless i don't think it's ammoniated and um, and that will brighten the brass but i would say what is the point of that you know it's uh, for me i i am never gonna do that again sorry <laughs> kind of asking the wrong person i'm afraid um but it's a good question there are products out there that are non ammoniated and waterless the problem with water based solutions is it completely tends to degrease the clock movement and you end up with uh, incredibly dry bearing surfaces. Not that you want the wheels and pinions to be oiled per se, but I personally find this process with uh, mineral spirits is great because it leaves the movement ever so slightly kind of oily, if you like, which seems to be good. It gets rid of 
quite a lot of squeaking. If you ever hear a clock squeaking, that's bad. So yes, there are, look at, look at the Elmer product and kick it about between you what you might use if you wanted to brighten the clock. But to kind of close on, people would, um, when I used to give uh, presentations on this, get quite animated about it, you can imagine. And they'd say to you, well, it's okay for you, Matthew, you work at the observatory or wherever, nobody cares what you do. But the reality is that for most of my practice life, like now, uh, I'm repairing clocks for regular people like you're repairing clocks for here in Yorkshire. Um, they are no more or less informed than anybody else. And I can put my hand on my heart. Nobody has ever said to me, why isn't that clock bright and shiny? Never, not once. Everybody, that's never cropped up in conversation. And of course, that might be how I approach the thing from a kind of relatively, what I call conserva uh, conservative perspective, but that just doesn't come into it. What people are interested in is the long-term or longer-term preservation of the object, I think, and also the fact basically that you take it, deliver it, it runs, and they don't have to ring you up in three weeks because it's not working. So that's where I prefer to spend my energy. So long answer, I'm afraid to that. And that question will run and run. So thank you for raising it. Um, are we done? Great. Thanks very much for bearing with what has been a, another kind of marathon session, two hours. Uh, but hope it's been of use to see some of the thinking. As I said, there is no right or wrong way. Um, don't, in my view, be led down that path. If you hear somebody saying you're not doing it right, that's bodgery or something, then I think alarm bells should ring, our uh, clacks should sound and flashing red lights should go up and so on. So we'll see you, uh, if we don't see you on Saturday for Open Clock Club or on Facebook. In the meantime, we will see you all being well next Thursday, same time. Uh, but remember, the clocks go forward. So if you're not in the UK, uh, I didn't realise that internationally we don't all change the clocks on the same day at the same time. So please bear in mind that we might be an hour out of step. So thanks a lot and see you next week. Bye. It turned off.